Hi, and welcome to Little Fish Studios Presents How'd You Do That? featuring uh, a bunch of guest artists who are going to talk about their amazingly cool processes that they go through to create comics. We kind of divided the sections of tonight's presentation up into what our different specialties are. But before we start that, um, we're going to introduce ourselves. My name is Patrick Yurick, and I am the co-founder of Little Fish Comic Book Studio and the co-creator of um, American Boom, a webcomic. And tonight I'm going to be specializing in talking about uh, the digital painting process. And I think it's Scott. Scott goes first. Hey guys, I'm Scott King. I'm the writer and creator of Holiday Wars. Um, other than that, I teach college and I'm a part-time photographer. Excuse me, I'll unmute myself. My name is Emily Gillis and I do the webcomic Jacosha. Um, today I'm going to be talking a bit about my drawing process. Hi, my name is Mark Litke. I do the webcomic 2816 Monument, and I work for VCU Arts here in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I spent a long time being super frustrated with trying to mix traditional and digital, so I'm going to try and go over a little bit of that and maybe give you all some tips and tricks to speed up the process. I'm Krista Rollins. I write and draw the comic aspect for Wayward Studios, as well as doing colors and editing for Jacosha for Emily Gillis. As a day job, I do print prep for a company called Rainier Industries that does large format prints of all kinds. And I'm going to be doing a rapid fire explanation of my coloring and shading process today. Hi, my name is Bijan Khodabanda, and I uh, do a webcomic called Richmond Monuments. Uh, my day job is to work at VCU Commonwealth University's communications director for the communication arts department which I know is a little confusing because there's a lot of communications in there. Um, otherwise, I'm also a freelance designer and illustrator. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, back-end side of comics, the process of uh, strengthening your skills as a comic book artist. And back to me. So we're going to be talking a little bit. I'm just going to give people a general overview of what's happening. Um, we're each broken into five-minute segments, and we're going to be talking specifically about uh, the different uh, stages of the comic creation process. Scott's going to talk a little bit about writing. Emily's going to talk a little bit about drawing. Um, Mark's going to talk about scanning and the, the prepping process. Um, Crystal's going to talk about her coloring process, and I'm going to talk a little bit about like what I do, which is what I kind of call digital painting. And Bijan is going to be talking about like the betterment process, um, and he'll be able to explain a little bit more about that when we get to him. We're just going to be doing these in about five-minute segments, and I want to remind the viewers, if you'd like to ask us questions, go to Google Plus and just type in Plus Little Fish Studio. I am monitoring our uh, feed. We've already gotten a question in, so... Um, Feel free to add questions into there as you see them, uh, as you see fit, and uh, we'll try and get to your Q and A's as we can. So, um, just to remind the panelists, remember to mute your mics when it's not your turn to share, or I'll mute them for you. And we're going to start with Scott. Scott, you're going to talk a little bit about writing. All right, hey guys, I'm going to talk actually a little bit about the scripting process. So, kind of the process you get to once you've done the brunt of the writing. Um, my background is that I went to school for film and electronic media, and I kind of teach writing in college. So because of that, I kind of gravitate toward the screenplay format. Let me go ahead and screen share. So here we are. This is a, a sample script for a uh, project. It's called Monster Eater, and it's a prequel to Holiday Wars. It's a 126-page graphic novel that's sort of hush-hush, but this is a little treat for some of my readers. Um, for the format, it, it's pretty simple. This up here is what's called the scene header, and it's basically saying, hey, this scene is outside in a field, and it's later than the scenes before. This giant chunk of text is what's called an action line, or action lines, and they're just saying, hey, this is what's happening in this scene. This here is the character's name saying, hey, this character's speaking, and this is what they're speaking. And that's pretty much all there is to the screenplay format. And why that's important and why I think it's really useful for doing a first draft is because it makes it really accessible to rewriting. And rewriting is massively, massively important to the writing process. Uh, I'll go through a first draft in maybe 7 to 10 days of a 60-page to 120-page comic. 
but then I might spend three to four months rewriting that comic. And that's why the screenplay is just really, really helpful because I can easily go in and only worry about the story. You know, it's, it's only the characters. It's only what's happening on screen. It's only the structure and pacing. Now, once that script is locked, meaning once I've sent it to my readers that read for me, and once I've sent it to my editors and they've approved it, then I sit down and do a breakdown into a comic book script. So I'm going to open up a different program. This program is called Scrivener, and I'm a, a big fan of Scrivener. I'm just going to put them side by side for you. Let me do a screen share again. So here we are. This is Final Draft. This is where I have the original script and screenplay format. And over here is where I did the comic book script breakdown in Scrivener. Um, right off the bat, you can kind of tell that a half a page in Final Draft equals a full comic page in Scrivener. And that, that's not always set in stone. It really just shifts back and forth, whether it's an action scene, talking scene, or all that kind of stuff. Um, but when you look at it, I kind of made my own breakdown. Like, there is no set format for doing a comic book script. There's no right or wrong. It's kind of whatever works best for you. So because I'm coming from a screenplay, I go ahead and basically steal the scene heading and then throw a panel number in front of it. So in, in this case, it is a wide shot of a sun rising over the mountains, shining on a wheat field. Very basic, very simple establishing shot. And why I like to do this separate from the actual scripting process is because to me, the scripting is, is very much a creative place. You know, I'm worrying about dialogue and what's this character's motivation and how's the story moving forward. But when I go over to the comic book script breakdown, it's much more of a, an artistic visual field. You know, in, in a sense, comics are a visual medium. You know, it, it's taking this panel, this panel, and juxtaposing those together to define what kind of movement or what's happening in them. And for me, at least, I can't do that when I'm doing the creative stuff. I can only do that when I'm focusing on the actual layout of a page and that kind of stuff. So that's why I like to separate the two processes. Um, so that, that's basically the workflow. So the writer, or me, I go ahead and do the script breakdown. Once that's done, I don't even bother sending that to my editors because they've already approved the story. And it just goes directly to the artist. So in this case, for Monster Eater, I'm working with a guy named Jeff Ruslan. He's a Canadian. He's a great guy. And let me go ahead and share what that art looks like from that finished page. So here we go. This is the finished page. It's a wide shot, the sun coming out of the mountains with the wheat field. And that's just the, the basic scripting process we use for Holiday Wars and that I use for other projects. Back to you, Patrick. Great. That was awesome, Scott. But that art looks really cool. Um, thanks for sharing it. Uh, and um, I think we're on to Mark or Emily. Emily's talking, right? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I missed up the order. It's Emily and then Mark. Right. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I, um, I'm going to talk about my drawing process, as was mentioned earlier. Um, I still work traditionally. I use 11 by 17 Bristol board. Um, which gives me enough room to work at about 150% of my final size. That allows me to shrink any mistakes and makes them less apparent, which, of course, is very nice. Um, I draw my own templates with blue pencil. The reason I draw my own as opposed to purchasing pre-made templates is that I'm cheap. I would rather spend $12 on a pad of paper rather than about $20. Um, so I blue line my templates. I blue line my uh, layout, as you can see here. Hopefully, blue line so it doesn't exactly transfer well. <laughs> um, and from there I might go a step further with the same pencil and gesture in the characters, any important details in the background, just kind of finalize my layouts um, from my little quarter size thumbnails I do. Um, I will further develop the drawings just using a normal pencil and um, do the same thing with the backgrounds. This is where things get um, a little bit different from what you'd normally expect. I will ink the drawings as I go. Let's say I'm working on a particular character and their face is just not happening. What I'll do is I'll find another piece of the drawing that I think is just rock solid and start templating that or inking that. Um, as you can see here, down the bottom I've got this panel here that's partially inked, partially pencil. I was having problems with this little face down here so I decided just to keep the process moving forward. Um, as anyone in comics will tell you, time is money. The more you can fit into your working hour, the better. Um, this also allows me to, if 
finalize the foreground, and then I can draw through the image with the background. Um, as a left-handed person, I tend to smudge a lot, so I can feel free to mess with the lines um, if I've already got part of it inked and not get confused by background lines intersecting with my foreground. Um, I have several different pens that I use. I primarily use micron pens. I use these for small details and backgrounds where line variation isn't that important. And then I have several different kinds of brush pens I use. I've got a Faber-Castell that I use that is nice, but it doesn't hold its tip that well. I've got a small little Sakura brush pen um, that I think has a very nice tip, but doesn't give me as much variation in line as I would like. And then I have the love of my life, my Pentel pocket brush, which feels the closest to actual brush and ink than all my other pens, keeps a very nice tip, and gives me a wide variety of line variation for special effects and areas that are uh, kind of zoomed in. And that's my drawing process. Cool. Um, all right, so next is Mark, and Mark's going to talk a little bit about how you take that drawing process and then kind of start bringing it over, and I'm guessing there's going to be some overlap between all of these different presentations. So it's your turn, Mark. Hey, how are you all doing? Um, I, I like to work uh, traditionally, and I work large. Um, and when I first started trying to get things like this on the computer, this is, uh, I believe it's 14 by 19. I'm not actually sure what the size is. But um, the large format scanners are super expensive, and I don't have one, and I imagine a lot of you guys don't. Um, so when I first started doing this, I would scan in parts and try and manually stitch it together. Um, I'd also try and do uh, different ways of trying to actually color it, and it was super frustrating. So I'm just going to kind of go over some of the things that I do so that hopefully I can ease some of that frustration for you guys. Um, so let me kick over to a screen share real quick. Here we go. So when I, when I scan things in, um, it comes in in uh, multiple parts. So here is that page that I was just showing you. And these are the four parts that I have. And Photoshop has a really nice feature where if you come to File, Automate, uh, photo merge. What this will let you do is it lets you browse for those pieces that you scanned in. You can open them and it's going to set them up in this key and if you hit OK, Photoshop is just going to chug through a process and give you the entire thing exactly as you have it, which is what I have here. Um, this is me just running those things straight through the process like before. Um, once it comes in, I, I like to work in blue lines. Um, and you need to get those things out of there. You also need to clean up your uh, um, the inks because these aren't coming in as dark as I'd like them to be to, to start working with. So um, the first thing that I will do on that is you go into Edit or um, Image, Adjustment, Hue and Saturation. And once you're in there, OK, I've got to select the right layer. Um, Image, Adjustments, Hue and Saturation. And once you come in here, what I'll typically do is just bring the saturation all the way down. And what that's going to do is it, it already brings everything to grayscale and it gets rid of any of the tint that you're going to get off the scanners. A lot of them come in. Mine comes in with a little bit of a blue tint. Um, the next thing that I'll do is come into Cyan's and I'll bring the light all the way up. And that's going to get rid of most of these blue lines that you'll see. I'll also hit the blue to do the same thing. Um, and that should get rid of them entirely. So once I've done that, you can see that all the blue lines are gone, but I'm still left with uh, kind of lighter darks than I'd like. So to fix that, um, <clears throat> we'll go to Image Adjustments again, and we're going to go to Levels. And what that's going to do is it lets you get your whites super white and your blacks super black and really get that contrast the way that you want it. Um, you'll have to just play around with these on your particular pieces, but just real briefly, this one here, um, you'll see that the whites are kind of lightening up. Um, and then this here will bring those blacks really down. And then the one in the middle kind of gives you a little bit more control there. So you'll see that my blacks are getting really dark here. Um, so now once I come back out, um, I'm almost ready to actually start doing stuff. Um, when it comes in here, if I want to start coloring, when I first started doing this, believe it or not, I would actually try and fit in the lines, and it was ridiculous. Then I learned about Multiply, and what that does 
is it makes your whites transparent and your blacks opaque. So now if I set my inks layer to multiply and then come to the layers underneath, I can start coloring really well and, and just like normal. Um, the first thing that I'll do when I set up a new thing uh, or a new page is I'll drop in a background layer. So um, just select all and drop in that background layer. And instead of manually erasing all of this stuff here and erasing all the gutters, um, one of the things that I use a lot during the process is the, um, the magic wand tool. And I'll come back to my inks layer and I'll just select the whites. And ma just make sure that you have contiguous selected here. Um, otherwise you'll get all your whites everywhere. But what this does is it allows me to then go back to that layer and delete out and I've automatically fixed all of this stuff. One of the things you'll want to do when you're doing that is um, go up to select, modify, expand. This is for your selection here. You're going to expand that by a couple pixels. I like to go with four. Um, you can just mess with uh, what works for you. What you'll see is it's eating into the blacks just a little bit so you don't get any of the uh, anti-aliased colors out there and it really kind of keeps everything really nice and clean. Then we can do that and that works really well. Um, this this particular process works really well for um, uh, word bubbles. They're a pain in the butt to try and uh, hit in the lines on everything. Um, so again, you can just do that with that right there. Um, this sort of process of just cleaning up the outer edges is one of the things that I like to do a lot on this. So I won't really worry about the edges here or any of any of the gutters. I'll just mark all over that stuff and then just come back and clean it up when I'm done. So uh, that's about it for me. And I think uh, Crystal will give you some more ideas on how to actually color this stuff beyond prepping it. OK. All right, so I've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to go kind of fast. I'm you know, hey, Crystal, oh. we're, running, uh, we're running quick, so B is um, you can you can you can go explain as much as you want to. I guess is what I'm trying oh, to say. Oh, okay. All don't right. feel the need to like rush. I can take up the whole hour, so don't give me too much. <laughs> I'll give you a warning. Don't worry. All right. Either way, starting into Photoshop. All right. So I do the coloring for Jacosha, and my comic's black and white, so I'm actually going to use Jacosha for my demo. Uh, so when I get the pages from them, they look like this. They've got the guidelines in there still, and they're set up in flats. Well, I'm going to do one of the panels today, um, and to show you, the way she sets it up is she does the flats in several layers, so that I've got not only the colors sectioned out, but they're in separate layers so that they also create separate shapes that I can use as part of my coloring process. So the first thing I do, actually, is I add a gray tone layer above all the colors because when I'm doing the shading the colors actually tend to be kind of distracting so what I want to do is take those out I just set a grade about 90 percent so I get a little hint of colors but it dulls everything down and then I go in with a soft like an airbrush tip in Photoshop and I'm just gonna put in some general sort of shapes at first I'm trying to identify where the large blocks of shadow are and get those in there no no real definition yet. For that, I go back in with the lasso tool, and I'm going to build up certain shapes with the lasso tool where I either want the soft edge to end crisply, or a wider shape where I'm going to let my brush taper out more. Such as like where I want the roll of his shoulder to be soft, but the edges where it hits his collar or the side of his shoulder to be more crisp. And I just continue to build up like that, using the shapes and the soft airbrush tool to give me definition over time. Um, I also use some low opacity brushes with my Wacom tablet to kind of create like the cast, the reflected light in here, like softer forms within the shadow. So for hair, I actually use a sharper brush I found to erase away the highlights. Hair, you tend to have to shade completely different than everything else because it just uses different lighting rules. Um, so there I've like erased away the rim lighting around his head and left the general shadows in that I had put in before. And from there I'm actually going to make a second shadows layer so that I don't have to worry about mucking him up while I go on to working on Nifty. And I start out the same way, I brush in some really general shapes and then I work in in a little more detail. So this is showing an example where I can use the 
the magic wand tool to actually select the colors from her separate layer to create a selection so I can work on the bars and make a nice crisp edge where those bars are without disrupting the shapes I'm already starting to form for her. And I just I build up the shadows using a brush on a separate layer and I've basically finished her. I did some some harder layers for the bars to make like the the cast shadows created from the bars over her body. And then what I'm going to do after that is I'm going to use the layer that has his flats and I'm going to control click onto that layer. See like right here if I just hold down control and click it will automatically create a selection based on what pixels are filled at what transparency on that layer. So I can use it like a masking tool. And then I'm just going to invert and cut away the pixels I don't want for him and I'm going to do the same thing on her layer and that's cleaned that all up. And then I'm going to work in a third shadow layer just to put some general shadows and tones into the background. This is really quick. <laughs> I work the backgrounds really quick with brush strokes. Just I sort of brush in really generally and then I erase away little textural details to give some impression of what's going on in the room. And in the same way, I use those layers again to form a mask shape and cut those out. So now everything's nice and clean together and I've got a basic... I've got three layers where I've been brushing onto those layers with the paint tool at various transparencies. These layers aren't op are not opaque, but they're set to multiply, so when I, I have an idea of how dark they are against the gray tone layer, but they're at various transparency levels pixel by pixel. It's going to be important shortly. So now that at this point, I merge three layers together, which looks a little odd because you're losing that multiply effect, so it just turns into a color blob at appearance. But what you've got there where you can see the colors coming through that gray is you've got various transparency levels that are going to create your selection. So then, at that point, I take all of my different layers that have been produced before and I copy them and then I merge them together where you're seeing this layer that I've labeled shadows and this other layer that I've duplicated again that I'm about to label lights. I'll basically... I'm going to basically have two full layers that are all the colors set up together that I'm going to then create the color selections from. So from that point, I'm going to do control click again onto the shadows layer to create a selection and I'm going to cut it out of the lights layer. And I've got another page I've finished before that I've gotten some lighting effects that I like. And what I'm doing here is you can copy a layer effect or you can actually duplicate your your action layers over to the other document you're working on. And so I copy my layer effect that I like for the lights layer over and you can already see where I'm starting to get some form coming into those shapes just from adding the lighting. And on the shadows layer I do the same thing, copying my layer style that I like only this time it's a hue and saturation darkening and also a massive red tinge. Um, from there, about the only thing left is I've got a little layer effect where I add a red tinge with a hue saturation correction to add some, like, blood flow look to the shading on skin because I found that skin shadows always need to be a little redder than everything else because people's skin is translucent. And it really kind of makes people look alive. It's really subtle, so you might barely even be able to see it there. Especially through the hangout, it tends to really flatten colors. And, you know, after I've done that to all the panels, and not just that first one, I'll have a page that looks about like this. Um, yeah, that's done. That was awesome, I Crystal. told you it was rapid fire. That was really cool. No, I really liked it. I liked seeing the process. Um, and I don't think actually ours are, are super, super different. I, I realize one of the things that I've been struggling with in my coloring process uh, since we started American Boom, I only did a little bit of coloring of Hipster Picnic. That was a bigger black and white venture. And then I moved into black and whites and grayscales and more just flats. Um, and Hipster Picnic was like a zombie comic that was just kind of like me experimenting with the web comic medium. Um, but I, I, I kind of, I'm going to turn on the timer for myself so I don't go too far over. I'm going <laughs> to talk about everything. But I've been, I've been kind of like really obsessed with 
uh, this idea of making comics look more natural. So when I got out of graphic design school seven years ago, <laughs> I, I went on a sabbatical from uh, computers completely. Um, and, and, I, and I just started painting. I went back to art school uh, for, to get, become an art teacher because I gave up on my graphic design career, which is probably a good move on my part, actually. Um, and I started just really wanting to get better. Uh, so the, my personal story only is that I decided I want to be a comic book artist when I was in eighth grade. And then all through high school, I would only work in black and white. So when I got to college and I started learning about colors and how colors work together for graphic design, I became kind of interested in that. And then when I finally quit, but I noticed like all of my graphic design looked flat. And that's kind of what I want to talk about right now is all my, I'm kind of obsessed with that. How do you take those natural qualities and start throwing them into uh, the artwork that you're doing. So uh, one of the first great resources I can share with you guys was um, Michael Dambold uh, did, um, let me see if I can get to it. Um, Michael Dambold, I hope I'm saying his name correctly, um, shared this great uh, blog about, it has 200 plus tutorials, brushes, and vectors to make your web comic explode with awesomeness. And it was like crazy because like, I, one of the first things that I was doing is I was using Creative Commons to go and, and, and swipe um, actual textures of watercolors. And I don't want to say that I was the first person to come up with this. I was actually kind of taking the lead from uh, Ryan A, um, uh, who did most of his comic, well, some of his comic, um, Nothing is Forgotten in My Living Room. And he was kind of talking to me about how his technique was to actually create different web comic, uh, different watercolors, scan them in, and then use them for the layers that he created in Photoshop. I was actually, so for the long, the first part 15 pages of American Boom, I was using Creative Commons and Google Search to like go look for various watercolor textures and then bringing them into um, Photoshop and, and using them as different layers. Um, but then I found Michael's uh, Photoshop tutorials and resources and one of the things that I gravitated to immediately just wanting to play with was Photoshop brushes and I started playing with um, like the these great like giant swatches of like uh, just texturized brushes splatters and 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 splatter brushes and and one of the cool thing about customized Photoshop brushes is that um, after you get done with this phase of the flats, um, so these are the flat colors for this particular comic, and what I would uh, what I would do um, to move from this flat stage to the next stage is I would, you know, select um, a certain area of her face, and I would do kind of what Crystal was talking about. Um, let me grab like not a crazy brush, um, but I would do something like Crystal was talking about, and I actually will use the pen the pencil first, Let's see if I can grab that, um, I'll use the pencil tool because I like that hard edge uh, for the first round of colors that I'll do, and I'm kind of just, I, I don't have multiple layers that I'm working, oh, I'm not on screen share anymore, jeez, sorry about that, um, so uh, I'll, I'll select this color shape, and um, then I'll just kind of go and I'll pick out, you know, her face color, I'll, I'll, I'll pick a darker version of it and I'll just start going through and adding like shadows where I, f I feel like they need to go on her face and and this is like you know the, a slow process because obviously I'm gonna go a little bit faster than this I, I like the uh, the pencil tool for this at first because it helps me remember that I'm just blocking out shadows um, and I just accidentally did all of this on my flats layer which I don't really want to do what I actually do is I duplicate my flats layer to kind of get to where um, Crystal was just talking about where, uh, you know, I can grab selections really quickly, so I'll, I'll duplicate this. And um, as I'm doing this, uh, this, this kind of um, work, I might even take a gradient bucket and I'll um, choose her skin color and then I'll click X, which is a quick key on the keyboard that switches between the two colors over here. Um, and I'll pick it again, and I'll choose a darker color, and um, maybe just to, to, to do my flow, uh, 
I'll, I'll choose the two different things and create a gradient. But anyway, one of the things that I wanted to, to, to work through and kind of show you guys was um, that with brushes loaded in here, these customized brushes, um, we can go in and choose like certain things like uh, this kind of like amazing, um, turn it on and I'll show you. Um, and, it, and it's really to get around and circumvent that kind of like the flat kind of feet. No, that, that looks horrible. Uh, <laughs> kind of flat looking uh, feel that you get when you're playing with comics and kind of give it that kind of like more edgy, uh, but also textural and some of the stuff that you might actually see in, in a real painted comic. Um, and I wanted to have those. So, so anyway, I've already completed this page. The, the final looked something like this where I was actually taking my time and accenting the emotions of the character that were coming out in the background. But I was really not using any paints, and I actually didn't paint any of this myself. It was more of me taking those brushes and the direction lines um, located here. Uh, if you can see this, like she just turned her head in the previous panel. And so like I was having her kind of like sway over and like kind of snap at him. So I really knew I wanted a splatter line in the background that kind of accented that motion line behind her. But stuff like that, again, I was using some downloaded um, uh, paint, uh, paint tex paintbrush textures. You can also do this by adding an overlay of a uh, watercolor texture and kind of grabbing from it. One of my students, I was showing them this, and they were literally like, but that's cheating. That's not real digital painting. I'm like, dude, like, I don't think you understand. I'm like, this is why, you know, you're, <laughs> you're a student and I'm an art teacher right now because <laughs> almost 90% of what we do is kind of what you might consider cheating. But it's more just borrowing different techniques and using them. So um, I've talked a lot, and now it's Bijan's time to kind of talk a little bit about the uh, betterment process. Bijan, 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 sorry, I said it wrong twice. It's fine, it's right. again, from Richmond, it's Southern. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the betterment, but first I'm going to share my screen, and since I am uh, a teacher, I like to lecture, and I'm going to have a little slideshow. So um, making comics has a lot of hurdles that can be daunting for the most experienced, the somewhat experienced like myself, and uh, even discourage someone new to the medium from attempting them in the first place. Quite often I hear people say things to me like, I have a great idea for a comic, but I can't even draw a good stick figure. My response is almost always the same. No skill or talent is something anyone is naturally born with. Skills are developed after several years of practice and several failures that eventually lead to some success. And even once success is achieved, most artists I've met aren't complacent with their abilities and need to continue working hard to surpass their current skill level. That might come as a shock to some people. It can be difficult to understand why anyone would need to continue to work so hard after reaching a certain level of competency in comics. The best analogy that I can come up with is that there's a reason why even the most skilled professional athletes rigorously, rigorously perform many of the same practice routines as an amateur. We can always do better, and it ensures less failures while performing on the field or making comics in our case. So I've compiled together several fun exercises to continue challenging oneself, a part of the comic process that is sometimes forgotten. One approach that a few of my friends have practiced is making a drawing a day. Nothing time consuming, just a simple quick drawing without any major commitments to a story, concept, or client. The drawings will become less precious as you complete more of them, which will help loosen you up and build confidence in drawing. To complement a drawing a day, there are websites with timed drawings that cycle through various images of models to emulate a figure drawing class. They tend to move from quick 30-second gesture drawings to longer, more developed figure drawings. Now, figure drawing is a useful tool for comic artists because spending time illustrating people realistically or somewhat realistically is going to inform naturalistic or cartoon drawings. An analogy that I often use with my students is that people involved in organized crime spend a lot of time understanding laws so that they can effortlessly break them without repercussions. 
the better that you understand how perspective, drapery, foreshortening, anatomy, movement, etc., the more convincing your abstract reality will be. Another great tool that I happened upon in a convenience store is a game called Story Cubes. It's a set of nine dice with images on each face allowing for over 10 million combinations. The idea of the game is to roll your dice and tell a story based on the images that land face up. Each image can be a slide or a page, or excuse me, panel or page. As well, strengthen your ability to tell stories because your focus will be on completing the challenge instead of finishing a masterpiece. Again, the more you do, the less precious they become and the more confident in writing you get. The 24-hour comic challenge started by Scott McCloud is another great way to loosen up and focus on storytelling. The challenge is to illustrate a 24-page comic in 24 hours. If 24 hours is too much of a commitment, try a 12-hour 12 12-hour comic and start yourself off. I co-organized one and participated in a 24-hour event myself. It was a great opportunity to meet several comic artists in person and force myself to strip my comics to their essence instead of fixating on individual panels. At the time, I was drawing comics that looked like this. But I was forced to illustrate something more like this for the 24-hour. A lot simpler, a lot more reduced, a lot less detailed. Another extremely useful tool is exercising one's ability to observe from life by drawing from life. Keeping a small sketchbook and a few pens and pencils on hand at all times to illustrate the way people interact, how they carry themselves, what the flow of the conversations are like, as well as paying attention to the environments and objects. When drawing like this, artists will tend to start recognizing patterns in the behavior of people, light, shadow, form, etc. And pattern recognition is the beginning stage to synthesize information in a way that informs mutations of the comics medium. Synthesizing seemingly unrelated objects or com concepts might be difficult for some people. In order to begin regularly building relationships between different objects, one needs to exercise that part of their brain. A great exercise to achieve this is this nine-step process that I've developed to break down an image and combine it with another. It's a lot of steps, so I'm making it available on my blog, along with links to other resources I mentioned. You can go to mendedero.com for a link to it. So the first step is to analyze the media to produce the object. The second step is to discover the basic composed shape. The third is to note the way the positive elements complete with surrounding space. The fourth is to note the effects of the negative space or the environment on the object. Fifth, to trace the shape of the object with your eyes in a meditative way, following the contours in a way that doesn't directly depict the image. Analyzing the planes and how they define objects in the third dimension. Analyzing how highlights, if any, affect the three-dimensional quality of the symbol or object. And then you repeat this with other objects, and you end up with this completed image that's combining two different uh, unlike uh, concepts. So after performing this process several times, you'll notice that it'll become easier to synthesize information, and you'll be doing it quickly and in your head, and begin to use that ability to then uh, create what we call dur durable mutations in the comics medium. With that said, if you ever feel defeated or stressed out or frustrated, just know that all of us are alongside you, doing the same thing, pulling our hair out, dropping our head on our drawing table, right along there with you. So good luck. Woohoo! <laughs> that was awesome. Ah. This has like been one of the the funner, uh, funner, the <laughs> better hangouts that we've done. I have to say, like this was really fun. I, I'm having a good time. Um, so uh, we didn't have as many questions. Uh, did you guys have any questions that your audience, uh, audience, quote unquote, audience had? Um, uh, most of the people uh, that have posted to our, our our interactions have just been kind of happy with some of the resources we've shared with them, and I, I'm kind of I'm really interested in um, hearing people's stories uh, as well. Um, in the sense of like, how has that process changed? How many years have you been working with your particular process? Does it, how long does it change? Um, so there, I mean, how long between changes? Like I know I've changed stuff in the past two months that I wish I'd known four months ago, but like um, how often does that happen to you guys? I can, uh, um, sorry, I'll, 
I, I tend to get stuck in ruts. Um, so I'll, I'll find a process that I like and just stick with it for a long time. I, uh, when I first started to think about getting serious with what I was doing, I went through a really long phase of spending ridiculous amounts of money on all the tools that I saw the people that I admired using and trying out tons and tons of different stuff. And uh, at this point, um, you know, these are my tools right here. I just use this brush pen and a blue line. And uh, um, I'm trying to incorporate paint and other stuff and kind of expand on that again. But it, it took me a long time to kind of pare it down. And I'm kind of excited about bulking it up again. We just got a really interesting question from uh, Bill Taylor on our uh, the Google Plus page. Um, how long does it take uh, from start to finish to, to create a page? Um, and I, I'll answer it first just because I'm talking already. Uh, the, it's really weird to ask that question. I would say from the, the writing process, I probably write stuff right now. I'm doing draft seven of chapter two of American Boom. Um, but it takes about a two-week process to turn it around. But in hours, um, because I'm working collaboratively, it probably looks around like 10 to 15 hours per page. But that's because Alonzo and I share different parts of the, the creation process. Um, so we're kind of microscopically looking. Coloring usually takes me five to seven hours to do um, in and of itself per page. Who, Scott, how long does it take for a comic to turn around, a page of comic to turn around for you? Well, it takes me three to four months to do the, the final solid draft of the script. And so if you're talking maybe an average of 120 pages, that's maybe a perfect page a day, just, just math-wise. Uh, it goes to Michael Odom, our awesome penciler. He pencils and inks. It's about an hour for pencils, an hour for inks. It goes to G, our colorist in Italy. That can take one to two hours. Then it comes back to me to lettering, which takes 30 to 40 minutes. Cool. Um, Bijan, how long does it take for you to turn around a uh, page of comic book art? <laughs> An obscenely long time. <laughs> <Same story. laughs> uh, I feel I feel like uh, the actual illustration process itself is probably sort of on par with a friend of mine, um, and it's it, it's broken up because of course I have a day job, but it probably takes a full work day for me to do my pencils, and then maybe a half a day uh, to do my inks and a half a day to do the colors. Um, but I'm kind of neurotic, and I tend to erase so much that I'm wearing holes into my paper for my pencil. So, it's, especially because I'm using crappy computer paper, I don't use uh, nice art tools. <laughs> uh, Emily and Crystal, you guys work collaboratively, right? Um, mm -hmm. or, uh, how long do you, would you say it takes to turn around something like that? Uh, usually, it takes me anywhere between six to eight hours to finish a page to send to Crystal. Yeah, so she does the original drawing, the inking, and part of the agreement is she does all the flats. And she actually does flats for my comic, too, as a discount, because she actually pays me to do the coloring, uh, because my coloring is awesome. But I give her a discount because she does flats on my comic, too, because I hate flats. I hate them. Um, and the coloring varies anywhere from, like, two to eight hours per page, because if I have a really complex page or a page that I'm really trying to, like, get correct, um, I can really fiddle with it for a while. Um, but if I, some of the pages, if they're like talking heads, I can literally go from start to finish of the shading in like two hours. Um, as for my comic, <laughs> it seems like lately Aspect's just taking forever because I've been rehashing some of the thumbnails from this chapter and I really hosed myself because I drew the thumbnails smaller than I used to and I've been having a lot of trouble converting them and figuring out what the hell I drew. Um, but those generally run me around six hours total, six to eight, because they're black and white. Um, yeah. Mark? Uh, Mark? Um, lately, they can take between two and ten hours, I guess, depending on uh, what's going on with the strip. This last one that I did, um, that one took a long time. The background was a lot more detailed than I normally do. Um, there was a lot of buttons in the studio that I had to draw. Uh, it took place in a radio station. Um, but yeah, quick ones go in maybe about two to three hours. Long ones are eight plus. 
Uh, we had a question from Facebook um, from Danielle Hargis who was asking um, about uh, how do we find our team um, and uh, just again I'll start it off and we can go in the same order again. Um, some of us don't have a team which is kind of interesting. I know for most of the two years I was working on Hipster Picnic I was flying solo on that whole venture uh, which isn't necessarily true. I had an editor and a guest writer every once in a while and somebody who was working with me on that. Um, but I can say uh, Alonzo and I, I was working, I mean, Alonzo and I just happened to meet each other through a mutual friend who was, uh, when I was working with the After School Graphic Novel Project, um, and we just kind of hit it off, I mean, despite the fact that he likes DC Comics, which I can't hold too much against him, but, <laughs> like, but, uh, uh, because I'm a, I'm a old school Marvel nut, but I guess this is like, you know, you pick your battles kind of a thing, so I had to move on with that. Um, how did the rest of you guys find uh, your artists or your team members? Uh, for me, I found Michael Odom through digital webbing like five years ago. I don't even know if people use it anymore. Um, for everyone else, it's pretty much going to conventions and socializing and say, hey, look, we're looking for a color wrist. Who do you know? And then word of mouth and so forth. We cheated because me and M went to college together and we've been rivals since like 2004, um, and it kind of, it's funny, our partnership is, because we've been each doing our own thing for a while and, you know, throwing ideas off each other, but me actually coloring her comic started when she switched from gray tones over to painting color on her comic, and she did all of chapter two with digital paint, and this is going to sound super mean. It looked horrible. She well, well, that wasn't the mean part. The mean part was that this... This collaboration actually started around the time Chapter 2 ended, because I'm like, so I really like Chikosha in color, but it looks like ass. And M's a good enough sport that she she admitted that she wasn't as happy as she liked on it. She's like, well, fine. You try a page. And I did, and that was really fun. I always have more fun coloring her comic than I do working on my own, which is probably a bad sign. Uh, I work alone, so I don't, I don't, I don't have a team, um, I work alone, the, the times that I have paired up with people, um, I did some comics with my brother a long time ago, and just doing fun comics with friends, um, kind of like role play comics, where you each take a turn doing a page, um, that's just good fun stuff, so. You can? Uh, yeah, I. I actually, um, for, for Richmond Monuments, it's pretty much myself, but I have a, a great friend, Ron, who I bounce ideas off of, and um, he's been a real asset. I met him, be, you know, through a mutual friend of ours, and I showed him the, the first few comics that I did when I first started, and he said, you know, you should change this punchline to this, or you should switch around the position of the character, and it brought so much that, you know, a few months later into the comic, I asked them, hey, would you be interested in just letting me bounce ideas off of you from now on? And it's been really, really useful. He's a great asset for me. That's a that's a really good point. Um, like I said before, I work alone, but uh, I bounce ideas off my wife all the time, and I've got a few good friends that I'll always show scripts to or, or in-process work. Um, especially for people who work alone, you need to have someone else who can come in and take a look at it because you're usually going to be staring at it for too long to be able to have any sort of critical eye on it. So, Yeah, I usually um, I pick three different editors. Uh, and they usually should be people that are pretty much um, going to like what you're doing. And um, my first editor that you should always pick is the one who tells you how awesome you are every time you give them something. And then, you know, your editor after that should be kind of your uh, content editor, um, somebody who's going to help you with um, how, like, on point are you with some of the stuff that you're writing, uh, if it's fact-based. I know I do a lot of research-based stuff for um, my stuff that takes place in San Diego and Tijuana, so I need to make sure um, that that's all on point. Um, and I also, a lot of my stuff is in Spanish, so I need a Spanish editor for that. Um, so they usually, that's the same person, Marisol Franco, um, who's uh, helping that. And then I have my lead editor. He's the guy who tells me if my comic is good. 
like basically he's helping me restructure it so that it kind of flows together as a good story. Um, and if he can happen to be a professional writer, that can really help. <laughs> um, and mine is, but uh, I, I like to have a multitude of editors working with me. Um, we had another question. Scott, actually, Scott from the actual <laughs> presentation asked, um, how do the rest of you guys write? Straight from outlines, thumbnails, or what? So, uh, Bijan, Bijan uh, do you want to start with that? Like, how do you, how do you write your comic? Um, uh, that's really, I don't, I don't think I have a real good process. <laughs> Quite often, um, I'll sit down and come up with ideas, because originally with the webcomic, it was a gag strip, so, and there are these anthropomorphized monuments, so it'd be me walking around, hanging out, and, uh, Curious, you know, what, what would happen, you know, pondering what ifs, essentially, I guess. And then the, uh, the zombie apocalypse thing is kind of almost a train of thought. There isn't really a lot of preparation that I'm doing. Oh, uh, Emily I just and say uh, that Crystal? A, a zombie apocalypse, I think stone monument people are probably, like, the best ever fighters of zombies because... You can't make a stone monument a zombie, so that's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, but go, it's making oh. it a little boring. <laughs> so I'm having, I'm, ha I'm switching it yeah, up because uh, kind of like stone monuments being uh, impervious. <laughs> oh no, stone zombies! That'd be terrible. Oh god, that'd be scary. Um, so my writing process is kind of like I go from sort of train of thought. Like I'll have really general outline sometimes where I'm like, this happens and this happens and this happens and this has to happen, but this has to happen first, so work this out later. And I'm just like trying to like barf out an idea that I'm trying to get out of my head. Because I'll literally have times I can't go to sleep because I've got some kind of great idea that's like, no, I don't want to read you right now. It's midnight and I have to get up at 5 a.m. Um, and then after that, I actually like kind of like a numbered list method. Like I'll, I'll literally use the list options in Word or in Google Docs and just be like, Item one, person standing in park, long shot. Item two, close up of Michelle talking to Jeremy. Jeremy says hi. Like I'll I'll almost just do like little little quick outlines and I don't tend to go into much more detail than that because I'll do a certain amount of rescripting at the thumbnailing stage since I am the writer, editor, and artist. So I've got I can be a little more slack when I do all of that stuff and have a little more flow from stage to stage than, say, Scott does, where he wants to put it all clear because he has to hand it off to somebody else and he wants to make sure they're doing his vision and not reinterpreting it too much. We have a couple uh, interesting questions um, coming in um, from Corey Blake, who I know who writes for the Comic Observer. Um, he wrote, uh, for Emily, does Ink As You Go ever run into a problem where you have to radically change the layout of a page and re-ink everything? I used to have that problem, but I, I haven't had that issue in well over two years, I'd say. Um, occasionally, I might have to redo a whole panel, but that's easy enough to fix. Um, if I do go to inking now, I usually have the layout done. I'm not going to change anything. So I, I assume that when you get to the inking as you go process, you, you do pretty extensive thumbnails then, so you know like exactly what you're doing? at that point? I wouldn't say extensive thumbnails. Um, I've actually got some right here I can show. They're pretty tiny. Okay. Um, but if I have any sort of questions about my own layout, I'll do that during the pencil stage. I'll lightly pencil it and I'll do it when I'm doing blue lines um, and get that figured out before I even get detailed with the, the, the art. And the next question was from Gwen, um, Gwen Patton, who's been following us uh, since the beginning of the, the Hangout. She asked, uh, Photoshop seems to be the software of choice. What other software or digital tools do you all use? Um, I, and I wanted to just point out that I have used Illustrator in the past for lettering, and I actually will sometimes bring that layer in um, like, I'll, I'll take a quick snapshot of it, and I'll do all my bubbles. Um, the Scott McCloud way, he, had, he released a video several years ago about how to do uh, lettering in Illustrator, and I'll, I'll sometimes grab 
that and bring it in as a Photoshop layer because I feel like it comes in a lot more crisp um, for letters from that. But it was kind of taking a long time, so I didn't do it uh, all the time. And then another way that uh, another two programs for a year I was using only free and open source software, uh, GIMP and um, Inkscape for all of my comic creation stuff, which I found um, very challenging when I was trying to do a lot of the, the streamlined digital painting stuff. So now I'm back on Photoshop. Um, but it was helpful to see, um, to use GIMP for, for it, because I now know how far I can push my students using free software if they're reticent to buy um, uh, Adobe products. Although with Adobe releasing CS2 for free, <laughs> um, like a couple of weeks ago, all of that seems not important anymore. <laughs> so does anybody else use any other graphic software? I, I use Photoshop myself, but a, a good friend of mine, uh, Josh Bauman, who does the strip, Caffeinated Toothpaste, he told me that he works in Manga Studio, and he seems to be really happy with it. Um, there's actually quite a few uh, um, other web comicers that, that seem to get a kick out of Manga Studio. I've never used it myself, but I've heard good things. I, I don't remember who I was talking to at Emerald City Comic Con, but I, I know at least like two of the people I ran across were doing Manga Studio and they were saying specifically that it works really nicely for gray tones, especially if you're trying to do manga-esque screen tone and, like, gradient and textured screen tone effects. And that apparently it outputs to print a bit better. So, because apparently there's a bunch of people, even, like, professionals. Uh, I was talking with Jenny Braden of Devil's Panties and Obi about how they're having trouble with, with halftones from bitmaps because a lot of the printers don't seem to know what they're doing. So they'll output really wide screen tones and blame it on the people inputting the files, which is really sad. I've, uh, I've messed with uh, something called ArtRage. It's, uh, it's only about uh, $60, but it can be... Uh, it, I think it's right now it's going for, only, for $30, and it's really great because it emulates actual art supplies, like the paint looks like paint, the markers look like markers, the watercolors look like watercolors. You can even squirt a paint tube on the canvas and then use a palette knife to, to swipe it away. And it's starting to gain more and more popularity. And I played around with it when it first came out, and it was just too close to the actual mediums for me to use viably as to color my uh, comics. But now they have these new selection tools and some other things that are that are making it a little bit uh, more useful, and I think I'm going to start playing around with it, even in the next strip, actually. I'm going to start playing around with that tool. There's another yeah. program I know um, other people use called Autodesk Sketchbook. I have a copy. Mm -hmm. I haven't had the chance to really play around with it much. But I've heard good things. Um, I know that Joe Quesada, um, the Mar Marvel, I, I assume everybody knows who he is, but I'm not, I shouldn't assume that. Joe Quesada does a lot of the pinup graphics for Marvel Comics. He's also the lead editor, um, the editor-in-chief over at Marvel Comics. He does his stuff with a combination of Autodesk. Um, and this is all for his pencils. He, he's a radically weird dude, but like he does um, Autodesk, uh, the one that you just mentioned, Emily, and then he'll also move to Manga Studio. Um, and he does another one for the mirror in the early stages when he's composing a piece. He'll do like a mirrored image. He does all of this. There's a. I have a link. I'll have to post it up, but to, just to show his process as it goes through, and it's all just to print out blue lines. Um, which he then ink pencils on top of to send to a professional inker, which I'm just always like, oh my god. Like, but um, uh, then, um, of course, I always created comics back in the day on a uh, good old paint bucket. Um. <laughs> um, there's actually one I just remembered, uh, Paint Tool Sci. There's a great comic I read online called The End that does a lot of their work through Paint Tool Sci. And I really want to try it because it's completely free. And everyone I've heard from M has actually tried it out. And it's supposed to be like the most pen like inking of like any program and that it actually does really accurate um leveling to the pressure on Wacom, because Photoshop notoriously, like you try and do the little fiddly beginning point or end point to a line mm -hmm. and it just it won't make it. You have to either yeah. go really fast, which is what I've gotten used to with inking, is that I make quick, big swoops to kind of cheat Photoshop into making proper brush strokes, 
Mm. Or it just doesn't make them. It gives you little fat, tubby, horrible ends to your lines. Or like really yeah, I, it goes really quickly from light pressure to heavy pressure without a nice taper. Can I say, I just want to jump in there because that's how I found I was using uh, the Wacom tablet with the older computers and older. Uh, I recently up, I have a I just got a MacBook Pro for a job that I'm working on, and I just bought one of the store bought like the ninety nine ninety four dollar bamboo tablets, and I don't have that problem anymore. Usually, that's like a processing glitch that was happening because it was just like doing too many things, but I found that that's kind of stopped happening with um, when you have updated the updated software and the updated bamboo uh, stuff, which is what the Wacom tablets are being called now. They're not the, the yeah, Wacom I, tablets. Yeah, I, I got to argue that because I use um, the Wake, the bamboo fun, the slightly bigger one that's about that big yeah. at work. I love it. I love the texture. I love the pressure sensitivity. I steal it and take it home half the time and do my inking with that and then bring it back to work. Um, cause I gotta so jump. we, I, not but to interrupt you, but six at work and I don't, I still have the same pressure problem working on the bamboo on Photoshop six on a professional Mac with 16 gigs of memory. So, I um, not to, we, we <laughs> it is seven Oh one. We've gone a minute over. It has been awesome uh, doing another little fish studio, uh, like kind of series piece with you guys. Um, we are going to be doing another one next month, so tune in, viewers, for that. Uh, we are doing the next one on April 15th. We're always doing them the third Monday. Um, I actually like the 6 o'clock time better than the 7 o'clock time. Um, but I, uh, it's been great. It's been really great having you guys here. And um, please tune in again next week. Um, and check out lilfish.us and American. Uh, Boom with three O's dot US for uh, more stuff. You guys do your shout outs for, for your comic books. No, I do. Wars. Wars. Yeah. There you go. Scott, that was Holiday Wars. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> so mine's uh, aspect.waywardstudios.net, or you can just go to waywardstudios.net and we've got big buttons for all the different comics you can read by us. Because there's a bunch now. <laughs> Find mine at jacosha.waywardstudios.net, also just at waywardstudios.net. Uh, you can find mine at uh, 2816, that's 2816 monument.com. And uh, I'm also doing daily drawings, so brand new fresh drawings every morning if you follow me on the Google Plus. So go for that if that's your sort of thing. <laughs> Have a good night. Bye, hey, bye. And Bijan. Bijan. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you can find my webcomic at uh, richmondmonuments.com or uh, you can go to mendedero.com to see some of the other work that I'm doing. Cool. All right, everybody. Have a good month. Good night. <laughs>